Brinhan Dar, everybody, good afternoon. My name's Oriel Miller, and I'm the director of the Institute for Welsh Affairs, the IWA. I'm aware that we have attendees from all four nations with us today, so let me briefly introduce the IWA. We are Wales' leading independent think tank, committed to producing high quality policy research and building a solid evidence base for bright ideas that will make Wales better. However, today's report is even more ambitious. We're not just trying to make Wales better, we're taking a look at one crucial aspect of the governance of the whole of the devolved UK, interparliamentary relations, or what I will apologise in advance for inevitably referring to as IPR. Our report was based on research undertaken by Professor Margaret Arnott of the University of the West of Scotland. Margaret is a Professor of Public Policy, a Political Studies Association House of Commons Academic Fellow, and a leading expert in constitutional and governance issues in the devolved UK. Her work brings together expert academic commentary on the topic of interparliamentary relations since the beginning of devolution. It also draws on original research in the form of interviews with current and former parliamentarians and staffers with experience of interparliamentary working. However, before I set out our findings, a few thank yous. First, to the members of the IWA governance group for their insights and providing the genesis for this piece of work. Second, to the Legal Education Foundation for funding our research and showing they are a very flexible and supportive funder. I'd also like to thank Dr. Ruth Fox of the Hansard Society and Gronja Walsh and Anna Mercer from Stratagem Northern Ireland for their help and insight and for helping to promote this event. And finally, I would like to particularly like to thank Professor Margaret Arnott for all her work on this important project. The idea for this work first emerged from our governance group in spring 2018. When we first began discussing the research, I think we all felt we were focusing on an important topic, but one which could reasonably con be considered fairly niche. It's fair to say that both the research itself and the publication of it has been somewhat delayed. First by some internal staff changes at the IWA, then by last year's general election, then the Brexit negotiations, and more recently by the impact of the COVID-19 lockdown. As time has gone on, we have all reflected that the issue has taken on a more and more urgent importance and greater salience. To now be launching this new report into the heat of the fierce debate about the Internal Market Bill could not give a better example of the importance of consensus building and mutual respect across the four democratically elected parliaments. I dread to think how relevant the report might be if we were to wait another few months. I'm delighted that Sir Paul Silk has agreed to chair our panel's discussion, and I will let him introduce the panel members shortly. Suffice to say, we have a group of experts on the topic here today. Thank you all. But for those of you watching who may be less familiar with the issue, I wanted to summarize what the problem is as we see it. The IWA was established in 1987, and one of the abiding motivations at that time was to help build the intellectual case for a devolved Welsh Parliament. We are therefore unashamedly pro-devolution and pro-subsidiarity. We don't take a view on the lively debate around Welsh independence, but we do accept one of its central premises, that devolution today can work better. Devolution was established in Wales on the basis of a referendum with the narrowest margin for yes. The then Welsh Assembly Government was an unusual beast with somewhat limited powers. Those powers have increased off the back of a further referendum and various Wales Acts. The problem is that the governance arrangements around those increasing powers simply have not kept pace. Intergovernmental relations have rightly received a lot of attention, but they are not the direct focus of this research. There is a near unanimous consensus among academics and the people we interviewed that interparliamentary relations are underdeveloped. There are few formal structures for interparliamentary working. The ones that do exist can be somewhat ad hoc and they rely too much on the commitment and interest levels of individual members. Opportunities to collaborate, share knowledge, thereby increasing understanding and cooperation across party lines have long been missed. The exception which proves the rule is the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly, the only formal interparliamentary forum, but one which one interviewee characterized as more of a conference style forum rather than a scrutiny body. There has also been the semi-formal interparliamentary forum on Brexit, which I know some of our panelists have knowledge of, 
and which was spoken about positively by many we interviewed. However, when it comes to IPR, positive, exception, positive examples are the exception, not the rule. All of this becomes much more acute post-Brexit, where the potential for policy divergence increases hugely. Yet our shared history, geography and constitution still bind us together and to a large extent always will. It's too tempting to focus on the current debate about the internal market bill. And I'm sure our panelists will have views to share on it. But in future, we should expect more and more decisions affecting the whole of the UK to be made on the basis of intergovernmental negotiation and consensus building. One of the key functions of the four parliaments of the UK should be to scrutinize our governments, but decisions made on an intergovernmental basis fall into a gap in that scrutiny. We need the structures, ways of working, institutional culture and resources to be put in place to ensure that interparliamentary collaboration becomes a routine and unquestioned part of every parliamentarian's role. So what would better look like? Well, we believed enhanced IPR would help improve Wales and the UK in four ways. A stronger democracy, with the four parliaments better able to scrutinize the actions and interactions between devolved and reserved policy, increased public confidence in all parts of the UK, that there is proper scrutiny of intergovernmental decision-making, particularly on essential frameworks underpinning the UK's future post-Brexit, greater efficiency and reduced duplication of the work of parliaments through increased knowledge sharing and the potential for collaboration between committees, individual members and officials pooling sovereignty with legislatures in the devolved nations would provide a well-functioning model for further devolving decision-making and potentially greater localism in England. I've said already that the IWA has chosen not to take an organisational view on whether Wales' future should be inside or outside the UK, but this issue clearly speaks to that major constitutional question. The fact is we do live in a devolved UK, a situation arrived at reinforced by the democratic will of the people of the devolved nations. There can be no question that attempts to ignore, circumvent or roll back the evolution strengthen the sense that many people in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland feel that Westminster simply does not understand or indeed care about their individual needs. My colleague, Professor Laura McAllister, has observed that it will be the unionists that wreck the union by not taking devolution seriously. And it's clear that as our respective economies fundamentally change post-Brexit and post-Covid, a one-size-fits-all approach to UK policy risks working for no one. Our shared history and geography means that effective parliamentary relations will be needed across the four nations, whatever our constitutional future holds. If the devolved nations do decide to go their own way in future, I would put it to those of a unionist persuasion that that should be a decision made positively rather than one driven by resentment and a feeling of being undervalued, disrespected and overlooked by some distant so-called centre. We did not set out to make detailed recommendations for how interparliamentary relations should be improved. We believe that lasting reform will only succeed if it is led by the parliaments themselves and is done on the basis of consensus and buy-in from individual parliamentarians, so they should decide how this happens. However, we recommend that reform should follow these principles. First, experiment, take risks and learn by doing. Earlier in the year, we noticed that both the Welsh Affairs Committee and the Economy, Infrastructure and Skills Committee in the Senate announced on the same day separate and parallel inquiries into the impact of COVID-19 on the Welsh economy. This was a clear missed opportunity to collaborate and one we brought to the attention of the respective committee chairs. We believe that recommendations owned by committees of two or more parliaments with true cross-party collaboration would carry significant weight with whichever government they were aimed at. They could also sidestep potential accusations of playing politics with one legislature taking a pop at, gov at a government elsewhere. We were disappointed the, government, the committees did not embrace the opportunity to try something new and learn from it, especially given that at that time, parliaments were quickly learning that scrutiny can be done very easily online. Second, formalize the role of all parliaments in scrutinizing intergovernmental relations. 
written agreements should be developed between the UK Parliament, UK Government, devolved legislatures and the devolved government on a best practice framework for inter-parliamentary oversight of intergovernmental relations. We should not accept a government that runs away from scrutiny, especially not from elected representatives. Third, strengthen the role of devolved parliaments in legislative consent. We really welcome the timely report from the Institute for Government on reform of the Sewell Convention, which goes into much more detail about this point. Fourth, learn from existing best practice in interparliamentary working. Our report, report points to, some inter, to the Interparliamentary Forum on Brexit as a good starting point. Some panel members have experience of this forum, so I look forward to hearing from them about it. Another approach would be for committees to make an explicit reference to interparliamentary cooperation in their terms of reference. This has been done by the House of Lords European Union Committee, for example. And fifth, improve public information about interparliamentary relations and decision making. This seems very obvious. Our report has dug deep into the problem and has sketched out the outline of the solution. However, we do recognize that the first step is for parliamentarians to agree with us that this is in fact a problem and to commit to putting the time and effort into solving it. I'm delighted now to hand over to Sir Paul Silk who will introduce our panel to seek their views on the Way Forum. Our thanks to you all for joining and attending today's event. Thank, thank you. Paul. Thank you very much, Oriel, and thank you very much for that very uh, comprehensive introduction. My name is Paul Silk and I was a parliamentary official both in the Senate uh, or the National Assembly for Wales as it then was and in the House of Commons and I also had the privilege of chairing the Commission on Devolution to Wales. I'm delighted that we've got such a distinguished panel with us today and I'm going to uh, introduce them in alphabetical order uh, starting with Mick Antoniv. Mick is the uh, Welsh Labour uh, a, um, AMS I should say now for Pontypridd and he chairs the uh, Committee on Justice, the Constitution and Legal Affairs and was a former Council General. Uh, Professor Deirdre Heenan is Professor of Social Policy at the University of Ulster and she's a member of the uh, uh, President of Ireland's Council of State in Ireland. Uh, the only non-politician or non-elected politician on the panel, but I'm, I'm sure she will have plenty to say about Irish politics as well. Sabona Jenkin uh, is the long-standing uh, Member of Parliament for North Essex, uh, currently the Chair of the Liaison Committee in the House of Commons, and of course for a number of years was Chair of the, uh, the uh, Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee in the House of Commons. Uh, there's a connection between uh, Sir Bernard and uh, our next in alphabetical order, Helen Mary Jones. Helen Mary Jones was born in Colchester, so has a, a, a connection that perhaps Sir Bernard didn't, wasn't aware of. But Helen Mary has very kindly stood in at the last moment. Liz Savile Roberts was due to join us, but has had to uh, take part in proceedings in, in the House of Commons. So Helen very kindly agreed to join us at, at very much the last moment. Thank you very much for that. She uh, was first elected to the National Assembly back in 1999. I had a period out, but is now uh, back as the uh, regional member for Mid and West Wales. And finally, uh, Pete Wishart is, uh, I think, the longest serving uh, member, uh, current Scottish uh, national member of parliament, is the member of parliament for Perth and North Perthshire. Uh, he's uh, the chair of the Scottish Affairs Committee in the House of Commons and also is a member of the House of Commons Commission. So we'll have views on the way in which the House of Commons is administered as well as uh, the politics of, of Scotland. So I'm going to ask them uh, to begin with that very simple question, what they think of what the IWA's report uh, says and what they think the priorities are going to be for action on that. And I, to go in the reverse order, I hope Peter, mind if I start with him? While Peter's unmuting, perhaps I should just say to those of you who are listening, then please type any questions you have into the chat box and we'll be able to uh, assim uh, assimilate them and, and uh, put them at the end of the, of the, of the discussion with the panelists. Pete. 
Um, thank you very much, Paul, and uh, welcome to everybody. And it's a real pleasure to take part in these proceedings this afternoon. I have, of course, uh, noted your report and I very much welcome it. I think, I think, as you mentioned, or Oriel mentioned, it comes in the same week as we see a report from the Institute for Government on the history and operation of the Seoul Convention, which could be more timely given the condition and situation that we are in when it comes to government relations right across the United Kingdom. Now, I, as you noted, I chair the Scottish Affairs Committee, and this has been a, an issue and subject that we've paid very close attention to, particularly as we came around to the 20 years of devolution last year. We're now 21 years old, and maybe Scotland will get the keys to the house when we get to that particular stage. But it's something that we've taken a very keen interest in, in development and just concurrent condition of um, IPR just now. And I think that'd be, I don't think it's uncontroversial to say that uh, relationships across the UK are probably at its worst ever, worst ever. The relationship between Scotland particularly and the United Kingdom government could not be more low. The, 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 the amount of engagement and respect and communication has never been so woeful and there does seem to be huge structural issues just about how the two governments are working together and how they're able to engage and discuss some of the very important issues that we need to debate when it comes to devolution across the United Kingdom. And I think um, we have to look to the infrastructure, the intergovernment infrastructure, just to get a sense of how badly wrong this has all gone. Infrastructure that's not been updated since the early days of devolution, which still was pretty much invented for a situation where you had one government in power in London and Cardiff and Edinburgh, where obviously it was going to work on that basis, being challenged and tested to its very fundamentals when you have different governments in Cardiff, Edinburgh and London, as we have just now. And we've failed to adapt, and devolution infrastructure has failed to adapt to the changing nature of devolution, the very real problems presented to it by different governments with different political views, ideologies, and what they want for the people that they represent and serve. And nothing's tested it more than Brexit, where right across the United Kingdom, different decisions were made of the populations about what they wanted. And I think it's, again, uncontroversial to note that the failure of devolution is particularly noted around some of the Brexit legislation, where you have a government in Edinburgh who do what they can to represent the 62% of people who voted to remain within the, e the, the EU with our UK government determined to leave on what could only be described as the hardest basis with the prospect of even a no deal Brexit. So the intergovernmental relationship and machinery, uh, in, in my view, is totally broken down. And if intergovernment relations are going to survive at all in any real capacity and do the job of effectively engaging the nations across the United Kingdom, we have to start at that and it has to be started at the Joint Ministerial Committee which met for the first time for years a couple of weeks ago and according to all who were there was unsatisfactory in how it dealt with and how it came to its conclusions. We in our report suggested and recommended a number of things that how the JMC could be improved and a lot of it comes down to dispute resolution because there's lots of disputes <laughs> which don't get resolved and that's basically some of the problems that we have. But this is going to really be up to the UK government. We know that we've got the Dunlop review which I was party to a conversation with Andrews, the, the chairs of all the, the national um, select committees. So we know roughly, it's on the desk of the Prime Minister, we know this is going to be looked at and we know the Cabinet Office are also doing their review of intergovernmental relations. And I think we need to see them pretty soon. Devolution is also now further tested by the fact that the constitutional debate in Scotland has totally opened up with the fact that we now have 55% of the Scottish people who would now choose independence over remaining in the union, a sustained majority which has emerged the course of the last year. And we're heading towards Scottish parliamentary elections next year where all opinion polls are indicating that the SNP could once again secure a majority which replicates the conditions when a last independence referendum was held back in 2014. And we're seeing support for independence, anything between sort of 52 and 55%. So this again adds another test and challenge to intergovernmental relations, particularly when it comes to Scotland. And I think, like, I'm looking forward to the, the questions and the conversations around about all this, but it is in a terrible condition there doesn't seem to be any obvious ways forward, regardless of the best attempts of the Institute for Wales and the Institute for Government. And I, I really don't see, unless there's a meaningful dialogue, conversation, 
and a sense of respect introduced back into governance across four nations, how it's going to be put back together again. Thanks, Pete. Helen Mary. You're on mute, Helen. Still on mute. You think you think we'd have cracked that by now, wouldn't you? Uh, I must uh, uh, b begin by sort of saying how pleased I am to be here. I'm very much a last minute off the substitutes bench, so I haven't had time to read the report in the detail that I would have liked to have done. But I am I'm looking forward to uh, going into some more of the detail around this because obviously for for us as a party that our ultimate aim is independence for Wales, uh, but in the meantime we want relations between countries on these islands to work well. Uh, and as things are, as Peter said, they very clearly are not. Um, I think what I'd like to do, Paul, if I may, is, is to respond from Clyde's point of view to the, the, the five specific proposals. And the first suggestion is that we should experiment, take risks, learn by doing. Well, I, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. Uh, but any new ways of doing things have to be based on a new understanding of equality and respect between the different parliamentary bodies on these islands, because without that understanding and respect, uh, it won't be possible to innovate because innovation has got to be based on trust. We would like to see the Senez uh, Commission participating in the discussions and developments of the ideas from this report, but we do all have to bear in mind, of course, that there are practical and financial costs uh, to this kind of cooperation, and we have to make sure that that's done in, in an equitable way. We strongly support the need to formalize the roles of, of all parliaments in scrutinizing intergovernmental relations. Uh, it, it's really important, and as Peter said, it's certainly the intergovernment relations um, are not working well at the moment, and that's in nobody's interests. I had, during my time out of uh, public life, uh, some dealings with the British Irish Parliamentary Assembly. I was working for a youth organisation, and we worked with our sister organisations across the nations and regions to bring young people together with the British and Irish Parliamentary Assembly. That was an interesting and dynamic process. But I do take the point that Oriel mentioned that in a way it's a bit more of a conference, it's a discussion forum. It doesn't yet have that role scrutinizing uh, the governments. And I think we'd like to see that develop. But it does come back to having to do that, that any formalization has got to be a formalization on the basis of equality and respect, uh, because otherwise the inherent imbalance where England is just so much bigger than the other nations and regions will skew any uh, joint scrutiny that takes place. Um, we very much welcome the strength, the idea of strengthening the role of the devolved parliaments around legislative consent. No law that affects the nations and regions should be passed by Westminster if consent has been withheld by those parliaments. And those issues should be resolved by intergovernment and interparliamentary dialogue. Uh, that would be the route, of course, to, to turning, giving the Sewell uh, Convention proper political as well as legal uh, existence. We're quite a long way away from that, and again, it comes back to this having to be based on, on mutuality. Learning from existing best practice is obviously a sensible way to proceed, both from a, the beginning, emerging good practice on these islands, but also I'm sure we'll have lessons to learn from elsewhere. Uh, and the fifth suggestion about improving public information about interparliamentary relations and decision making. Well, I think we would all subscribe to that. I think what I would say, though, is that we have a long way to go and people's understanding about what decisions are made where. And I mean, we still get in Wales, don't we mix sometimes a confusion between the Senev and the Welsh government. People are not clear in their own minds which does what job. Uh, I would say I don't think they're much clearer about the difference between the Westminster Parliament and the UK government either, mind you. I don't think it's, it's, it's unique to us. So I think there's a lot of work to do to help our public and our citizens to understand the nature and, and the changing and evolving nature of democracy on our islands. Of course, Plaid Cymru believes uh, that the ultimate future for Wales in, uh, is as an independent nation on an equal basis with our, our fellow uh, the people and fellow nations across these islands. Uh, I don't see a way, given the, the, given the extent of the asymmetry with one really large country and uh, surrounded by smaller ones, that you could create 
an equal relationship without independence. Uh, that's why uh, we will be launching our, our leader last year established an independence commission and we'll be launching the work of that commission an independent commission will be launching its report on Friday this week and, and that will have things to say about the current relations between uh, nations on these islands. And I'll just end, end by saying that you know, we cannot see where this level of mutual res respect and cooperation is going to come from but I would be very happy to be proved wrong. And I think if there are ways in which our parliaments can cooperate better with each other, can do that on the basis of, of mutual respect, then perhaps we could set a good example for our governments because goodness knows the UK government needs a good example when it comes to cooperation right now. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, Bernard, you, you've been a, a champion over the years of uh, greater interparliamentary cooperation. So um, how do you react to this report? I think you're on mute, Bernard. You're, you're on mute. I'm muting you again, there we are. Thank you. Um, um, the first thing I would say, thank you very much for inviting me along. And yes, um, the Public Administration Constitutional Affairs Committee did some work on this. And I quickly found it to be um, both extremely interesting, uh, potentially very important, and also very frustrating, uh, because there is such a limited audience um, in all all the jurisdictions for this kind of thinking. I think we can, those of us who care about um, uh, there being harmony between the four nations uh, on these islands. Um, regarded as very important but everybody everybody seems to be extreme me included extremely busy and distracted by other things and this is sort of pushed down the agenda i think first of all it's so um um this this space is so dominated by a lack the lack of common understandings about some really important things like for example uh sovereignty I mean, there are competing sovereignty, ideas of sovereignty in these islands now. There's even competing ideas of sovereignty within the Westminster Parliament, within uh, the uh, devolved parliaments. And uh, a, a constitution, whether written or unwritten, only works if there is a basis of common understanding. And uh, so the question that, that, that I think at the heart of all this is how we build common understanding. Um, the asymmetric nature of devolution in the UK is something that those who oppose devolution warned about and so it has come to pass. This is a very, very difficult um, uh, difficult circle to square um, and I hear um, uh, Helen Mary talking about equality and respect and then going on and saying there can't be equality um, uh, unless there is independence. Well, I, I have to say that I don't want to get into this uh, debate about independence or not, but I think the problems of equality, whether in, whether we have independence or not, are going to be just the same. Um, and the ease with which um, uh, Whitehall or Westminster uh, can seem to slight um, the other nations uh, is is always going to be there. And it, indeed, it existed before devolution, um, uh, and, and indeed was probably the cause of devolution. Um, so I think we should leave aside the debates about independence because uh, the approach that I took in on PACAC was not to was to try and set aside those that question by asking a, a, a higher level question whatever the future of each of the four nations and their constitutional status there are going to need to be ways by which we get along and, and cooperate um, uh, be it cooperation between governments um, or parliaments. And um, uh, much more thought needs to be given about how to develop trust, even if there are uh, different notions of very fundamental things. And trust can only be built if uh, we get to know each other. And I think the importance of the Interparliamentary Forum on Brexit was that we started 
talking to people we never talked to. Um, and I made it my business. Uh, I mean, when, when everybody came to London, uh, there was a very, the first time it was, there was a very budget sandwich lunch. And uh, when I hosted it personally, I made sure that we actually sat down uh, in a dining room and um, had some wine together as well as some food and made it, you know, created a more a congenial atmosphere. And when we went up to Scotland, um, uh, we booked a restaurant and we invited people around for a jolly discussion about everything. And I think people were astonished and the Scottish parliamentarians reciprocated with that on another occasion. And it was terrific. Um, uh, when I told one of my unionist friends who I had sat next to at dinner, he said, he sort of wrinkled his face and said, oh God, and I said, no, we got on terribly well and we found out what we had in common. And I think we need to spend much more time working out what we've got in common and not what divides us. In the end, um, I would like to see a proper interparliamentary assembly of the United Kingdom. Whether that remains of the United Kingdom is irrelevant, but there needs to be an interparliamentary sovereignty, uh, interparliamentary assembly of some kind that is formally constituted. Um, um, uh, a council of the UK where in principle the heads of the four administrations meet as equals even though uh, their resources and populations and other factors make them uh, very far from equal they should meet as equals in the same way as um, I think the European Union sets a good example here in its aspiration that the heads of state meet as equals not uh, whether it's Luxembourg or Germany and third I mean, the most urgent thing in my view is to put the Joint Ministerial Council onto a legislative basis, um, perhaps with a revolving secretariat, uh, rather than a secretariat concentrate, concentrating in the Cabinet Office in London, which tends to only think of doing something when Whitehall want, wants to get something done, as opposed to um, there being a genuinely shared agenda about what should, what should happen. And then I think the things that we really want to come out of it, like common, uh, a, a shared supervision of common frameworks which could be properly scrutinized by the interparliamentary assembly of the uk as as an interparliamentary assembly um, would, would come naturally and the final thing i would say and this is the hardest thing to get across to my colleagues in westminster is we just need to relax about a bit about the things we can't control in the devolved um uh, in the devolved governments and the devolved polities you know what in Canada, it was very, very striking how much devolution there is to the extent that when Canada strikes a free trade, trade agreement, the Canadian government cannot actually bind the, its, its provinces to adhering to that agreement. And if a province breaches the terms of an agreement in some respect, then the federal government has to pay the fine. And they still can't put the, put the matter right in the, in the, um, uh, in the province concerned. Um, and, you know, life carries on. But the other lesson from Canada, or we visited Canada twice, um, is Canada does spend an, an, an inordinate amount of time discussing the relations between the federal government and the provinces and the territories. And I think that terrifies people in the UK. They want a much tidier arrangement. Um, I don't know whether we'll ever get it, but um, how much better it would be if we all talked about these things um, rather than pretended that they weren't happening. I finished. Thank you, Bernard. I, I was not unmuting myself there. Uh, uh, Deirdre. Well, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this seminar. Um, and I would say to Peter, if you think things are bad in Scotland, you should come over to Northern Ireland. Uh, you'd be very welcome, where we appear to be in the eye of the storm once again, and in the news for all the reasons we don't want to be. But I would say this, I welcome the report because I think it is shining a light on something that we really do need to talk about. And there is a huge lack of academic uh, literature around this. We don't have the evidence to base good practice on. It has been kind of overlooked. And wheels have led the way and I welcome that. <clears throat> now it may be because in Scotland it's politically sensitive because of ideas about um, independence and here in Northern Ireland it is sen politically sensitive because we have 
not only east-west relations, we also have north-south relations. And of course, we have the added dimension of Irish unity and a border pole. So that makes the context quite difficult, but I do think it is important to say that this is an area of academic research that has been overlooked, that people aren't really willing to talk about, that is characterized by misinformation, misunderstanding, and generally people thinking, to my view, that isn't all that interesting. I don't really know why we won't spend our time talking about that. I think for many people, it's widely accepted that UK devolution is based on a clear separation of powers those that are reserved to the UK Parliament and those that are devolved. Sounds very straightforward. I think, you know, do we need to talk about it any further? Well, yes, of course we do. And I think Brexit and COVID-19 have illustrated that rather than being separate powers, they're interrelated, interdependent and extremely complex. Um, also Brexit and to some extent COVID-19 have brought into sharp belief the weaknesses of intergovernment relations within the UK. They are poorly developed, they are ad hoc, and they are very hierarchical. So we are in no doubt in Northern Ireland that we feel like we're small, but we feel we're beautiful and we should be listened to. Um, and it shouldn't be a matter of the largest um, dominating the discussions. So um, in short, I would argue that we have at the moment is simply not fit for purpose and really requires a radical overhaul. Finding consensus on what that might look like, I don't for one minute uh, underestimate how difficult that may be because people would want different things from the process. Some people may want ultimately independence. Could we ever achieve what we might describe as equality? But I think what we could all agree on is that reform in this area is long overdue. What that reform looks like uh, again, I think it's up for debate whether or not we set up new institutions, who pays for those, uh, what are the powers of those institutions is up for debate. But I do think that we could at this stage at least say there are a number of principles that would, we would want to move forward. Having those principles underpinning any development that happens to, to address this issue. And for us, and particularly for sitting in Northern Ireland, given that um, as I say, what has happened in terms of the Brexit debate, the fact that we voted to remain, the fact that uh, we voted against the bill, as did all the other devolved regions, but it went ahead. But I think more frustrating for people here, we were the people saying, uh, academics particularly, what about the Irish border? What are the implications for the Irish border? And we were either dismissed as scaremongering, or we were simply told um, there would be alternative arrangements. There would be technological solutions. Now, this is not to get into a debate about leave or remain. We've had that debate, we've exhausted it, but I think it is a debate and it's a good example of where people here understood what was going on, were on the ground, and the whole point about a devolved government is saying you have local knowledge, you have understandings about things that are interrelated, and there was a general feeling here that we were dismissed, that we were told we didn't really know what we're talking about, which was highly patronizing given that we live here. So I think the first principle would be around the principle of mutual respect. Mutual respect for each devolved region. Yes, Northern Ireland is the, the, the smallest, but we were in the spotlight and often felt that others were speaking for us, or of course that our voice wasn't heard at all. Now I have to accept that that was not helped by the fact that for three years we had no devolved government in the middle of a Brexit uh, crisis. And indeed, uh, we didn't have direct rule, we didn't have devolution, we were sitting in a, a kind of no man's land with our voices crying out in the wilderness uh, and no one listening. Um, sorry for the biblical references. Um, but I would think that uh, mutual respect is hugely significant. I'm not saying that's equality, I'm just saying respect for what people are saying and their local knowledge. Secondly, I think it's been said throughout the whole process of devolution, communication is key. We have to understand what is happening, why it's happening and what it's based on. And I think lines of communication have been very poor to the extent that people who are actually setting out to make mischief, and we know there are many people who delight in that, could actually make hay on the fact that communication was very mixed, very poor and a lack of understanding. So I think the second principle has got to be cooperation and communication. A recognition that our regions are interdependent and I was interested in what Sir Bernard said. 
regardless of what happens in the UK, whether it's independence uh, for Scotland, Wales, whether it's the United Ireland, we cannot change the geographical reality that we are near neighbours, we are mutually dependent, and no one benefits when we are in this fractious relationship where there's a lack of trust, where people are really feeling quite angry towards each other. Yes, that may, you know, may be a short term thing, but in the end, I think anyone looking at this would say, regardless of what happens constitutionally, we are independent on each other and interdependent and need to really work out what type of relationship we want to build with each other. So the third principle I would talk about is transparency. Parliamentary committees over the last decade have bemoaned the fact that we don't really know what goes on. Uh, we're told about decisions after they've been made. The minutes are vague if they do exist and quite frankly meaningless and I assume that's deliberate. Um, there are no detailed reports, there are no annual reports, and there are issues of lack of accountability. Uh, the Joint Ministerial Council has been mentioned by all of the speakers. I do really think that it is the main intergovernmental forum. Um, I like the, the comments to date about um, we really need to look at that and see how we can strengthen it and ensure that it is taken more seriously. I can speak from Northern Ireland and say that it isn't really taken very seriously. It's dominated by England. It's ad hoc. It doesn't have a timetable of meetings. Um, why does it not have regular meetings? I don't know. Um, I don't know that David Cameron maybe went to one. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Theresa May, I don't know if she went to any. And so the feeling in Northern Ireland was senior politicians from the devolved regions went along, took it very seriously and found someone chairing the meeting that they possibly didn't even know or weren't aware of. Um, and I think this is also the point that where we need the evidence. So in terms of academia, we can learn from Belgium. We can learn from Canada. What happens there and why, do, why does it work better? We're apparently equal players, but quite clearly we're not. And we don't feel as though we are. The, the devolved regions have complained about this for the last decade and basically our complaints have fallen on deaf ears where we're told to basically go away and stop moaning. Um, so I, I was particularly interested and did some work around the confidence supply agreement and, and the complaints from the devolved regions around the confidence supply agreement uh, and the fact that actually in terms of how that system worked and, and the grievance process. It was totally unsatisfactory. Essentially, England were marking their own homework and I think we really have to address that. Um, I finish up by saying we have to have a system where we can have some shape of co-decision making that everyone feels, okay, I didn't agree with that. That's not the outcome that I wanted, but my voice was listened to and I see this is now a decision that we can all um, say that it's an issue of mutual concern, we're all signed up to this. So I think when we're dealing with um, very politically sensitive issues such as Brexit, there needs to be transparency, consultation, and, and really then I think that is a way of addressing some of the contradictory messages and the feeling that people in devolved regions are powerless. I'm going to stop there because I could go on for the next hour, but I, I won't. Thanks, Deirdre. And Mick, finally, please. Okay. The first thing I'd say is um, on the information, research, the amount that's available, I actually think there's an enormous amount there. I think the problem is the interest in it is a very small niche grouping of people. And I think the biggest problem is that the interest in that research and that work that has been going on by all the constitutional legislative committees and many academics um, is not really taking hold as it should do within England, where I think one of the biggest problems actually arises. What today shows actually is how much common ground there is. By and large, I think there's very little disagreement uh, between all of us. Uh, and I think we all agree that the importance of inter -relation, intergovernmental relations is absolutely fundamental. And is fundamental whether the countries are independent, federalized, or whatever the structure of the union is, the fact of the matter is those intergovernmental relations are vitally important and we have to, we have to uh, address them. The fact that the, really the constitutional issue has been dysfunctional, has been neglected, derelicted for uh, several decades, I think leads us to where we are now, where we have a dysfunctional relationship and structure. 
So the Joint Ministerial Council was set up to try and solve that problem, to provide a mechanism for the four nations to work together. Uh, but it hasn't worked together. It's effectively been uh, an English joint ministerial council uh, to which the other nations uh, attend and quite often are spoken to and not very much happens. And the, the Internet Parliamentary Forum that I've attended, that Bernard Jenkins is on and, and others, I think has been quite an enlightening uh, episode. It has actually shown how you can create a forum between the four nations that really is looking at these issues seriously. But what it has come to the conclusion on, very, on a number of occasions very clearly is that it is not fit for purpose. And the failure to address that not fit for purpose, I think is a fundamental weakness. COVID has actually uh, changed the situation quite dramatically because we have now been experiencing four nation government. We've actually shown that you can have intergovernmental relations that can work together uh, if there is trust and cooperation. Now that may be uh, a problem. And I think one of the problems is quite often UK ministers, and I think even the UK prime minister has struggled to understand the importance of mutual engagement and the role of the devolved governments. Often ministers not even understanding at UK level when they're speaking for the UK or when they're in fact speaking as English ministers. Now, Common Frameworks is actually at the core of uh, resolving, I think, some of these problems, uh, and in the, certainly in the post-Brexit environment. And there have been discussions on Common Frameworks, um, and they have been very positive, and they're very constructive. They have been to often uh, erratic. Um, but there was very, very clear progress, and I think it's because within all four nations, there is an understanding of their importance, a clear understanding that there has to be uh, arrangements, mutual arrangements for an internal market. Now, what I will say is, unfortunately, the internal market bill drives a coach and horses through the JMC. Intergovernmental cooperation and cooperation on development of common frameworks uh, is now, I think, threatened and threatens to destabilise the UK still further, probably at the worst possible time. Uh, and in my view, I think it is politically damaging and irresponsible. So if the bill is not substantially reformed or dropped, I think it will be the final nail in the coffin of the Sewell Convention, and I think will increase fragmentation of the UK and political polarisation. What should happen in terms of the JMC? I think the JMC is still salvageable as an interim uh, step, uh, but it has to be on a formal basis. It has to have a legal a legislative framework and there has to be a dispute resolution mechanism. Um, you know, one step forward also is to make Sewell justiciable. It has a statutory basis. It is just not justiciable. And I think unless these issues are addressed, uh, I think the, the political instability that is growing uh, will continue and it will continue in a very dysfunctional and erratic way in a very damaging way for the peoples of all the uh, uh, nations of the UK. Thank you very much for all the panelists for uh, this very interesting tour de raison that we've, we've had them you all. I want to bring it back a little bit towards the inter-parliamentary uh, relations and I, I, I really wanted to know what your parties, you think your parties think about this. Uh, in the case of the, the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, uh, parties which uh, are represented, of course, in the devolved legislatures, but uh, are more represented in, 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 in London. Uh, in the case of uh, Plaid Cymru and the, and the, and the SNP, uh, parties which have Westminster representatives, but also have uh, very different sometimes thinking representatives in, in uh, Scotland and Wales. And uh, Deirdre, perhaps you, you can talk about how the parties uh, in Northern Ireland approach the idea of uh, uh, inter-parliamentary relations being developed better. What's in it for, uh, for an MLA who, uh, to have relations with uh, MSs in Wales? What's in it for uh, a Conservative M MP from Lincolnshire uh, to think that this is an important issue as far as he or she is concerned. Uh, can I start off perhaps with uh, Pete? Uh, can I come to you first? Well, one of the, the most interesting features and developments in the course of the past few years is just how well all the devolved assemblies and parliaments have worked together in common interest when it's come to issues particularly around um, 
just Brexit. We've seen like um, Scottish Parliament, Scottish Government and the Welsh Government, for example, taking common lines and approaches and a lot of the issues to do with Brexit. I think that's something that we didn't see in the early days of devolution. There would always be very much a difference of opinion. So I think there is a, a commonality of interest that's starting to emerge across the UK in the devolved areas just now. And it, it usually is directed at the UK government you know, who like, um, do approach this. And I, and I was interested in, in a number of points that were made in, in this feature that the UK has a difficulty when it comes to intergovernmental relations because it speaks for the whole of the UK, obviously, with the parliamentary sovereignty aspect of it all, but it also speaks for England. And this is what we're up against all the time when we're dealing with working across parliaments and assemblies is that there's no effective voice for England when it comes to these things. And so what happens in things like the JMC and other intergovernmental forums is that it's basically a matter that the UK sits down there as the representative of all of us when it comes to the reserve responsibilities, but also has got responsibility for, for England when it comes to all the devolved arrangements that we have. And this creates massive problems and it was something that we encountered when we looked at this, the Scottish Affairs Committee. And what, what this tends to then is how is this resolved and how do you fix this out? And one of the things that we have to acknowledge and except is that there, there is no desire for any sort of further regionalism across England. There's, there's no desire or appetite for any sort of regional assemblies emerging from any parts of England. Perhaps exclusively quite different, different is, is London, where there is now experience of some sort of government in London, and you do sort of sense a little bit of autonomy when it comes to all that. But other than that, there's, there's, there's absolutely nothing. And I think that is the, the major block to arrangements working right across the, the whole of the UK. Another thing to say about the Scottish National Party is, yes, um, we're the, the government in Scotland, but we're also the third party of the United Kingdom, which allows us obviously a, a lot more interest when it comes to the UK. We get, we get obviously dealt a little bit better than we're just six of us when I was first elected to Parliament. So like, um, we've got an interesting role within the House of Commons as the third party. And you mentioned the fact that I'm on the House of Commons Commission and I'm there, but the fact that, you know, there's always been a place for the third party, the UK on that. And like um, Ian Blackford as our Westminster leader is taken early in, in debates and he gets the two questions to the Prime Minister. So all these things sort of change, but there's, when it comes to Westminster, there's um, other than perhaps the select committees, there is no way that we do work together, I think, in the House of Commons. And it is really through the intergovernment arrangements and relationships that we have across the UK that there is that commonality of interest that's put forward. But it is very interesting, the fact that there, there does now seem to be more of an engagement working together from all the devolved governments. And um, I think that's something that we should all be welcoming. Bernard, as our other MP, what, 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 what's the view in the Conservative Party about this? I think you're muted, Bernard. Are we on the record and being recorded or being we are, on the record? We are on the record, yes. Um, well, I would um, address this comment to my colleagues that um, our relationship with Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland is absolutely, uh, the relationship of England with Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland is absolutely crucial to England's sense of national identity and uh, indeed um, to the respect that we, uh, we want in the world. And um, at the time the Scottish referendum was taking place in 2014, um, people were far more perplexed about what was happening to the United Kingdom than they were most people when we were voting to leave the European Union. Now, I know that's all very controversial <laughs> and other people will bridle at what I'm saying, <laughs> but um, um, uh, I mean, there are special circumstances why parts of um, American politics are so involved with the politics of the island of Ireland. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't think that's a, a general factor across the rest of the world. Um, uh, the uh, somehow um, we've got to cut through um, to people's understanding of this, and this will require government leadership. 
this will require the leadership of the most senior people in the party uh, to set the right example and set the right tone in the relationships um, that we have uh, with the other parliaments. Um, uh, I, I sense, um, as there would be in any government, and bear in mind, we've inherited this um, devolution settlement um, as it is, uh, and its evolution from um, um, a situation where um, the, the Labour government devolved in a very binary way and was uh, on the assumption that Labour would be in charge in, in Westminster, in Edinburgh and Cardiff and um, Northern Ireland was always a, a, a separate uh, case for obvious reasons. Um, but the idea of what the French might call cohabitation, <laughs> um, of, of different parties in different administrations in different parts of the United Kingdom wasn't something that the Labour Party really entertained. And of course, it's that infrastructure to deal with that conflict. Um, but I, I, I'm also, I would also just encourage everybody to be um, positive. In democracy, you have to have conflict, otherwise you don't have democracy. If there aren't different opinions and ways of resolving uh, different interests and opinions, then you've got an autocracy or a dictatorship. You don't have democracy. So we live in a different kind of democracy now. And I think England, if you like, is taking the longest to adapt um, to that reality. Um, and But adapt we must. Uh, um, otherwise, we'll be adapting to something even more that perhaps England finds inconvenient, which is um, independence. And uh, I, 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 I would also invoke my colleagues, uh, my English Conservative colleagues, to understand why we want um, Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland to remain in the United Kingdom, because um, that does not necessarily impinge on the doorstep or in the pubs of Lincolnshire, which, to which you refer. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, Helen Mary, I'll come to you next because I, th I know that you have to leave to take part in First Minister's questions shortly, and then I'll go to Mick and, and finally to Deirdre. Yes, I do, and my, my apologies to that. I, I was not expecting when I agreed to do this to be having to ask a supplementary question to the first question of the First Minister. So, uh, but I, I, I think in terms of what is it, why is it in our interests as parliamentarians uh, to cooperate. Well, it's in our interest as parliamentarians to cooperate and to do so, to pick up on something that Deirdre said, in an effective and a transparent way, uh, because there will always be decisions that affect all the countries of these, uh, of these islands, and whatever decision is made in one part will affect others. Um, and that is more true after Brexit, the need to cooperate. You know, we can no longer regard, rely, for example, on European environmental frameworks. So we must ensure that we have effective uh, frameworks across these islands. Uh, I think it's therefore in the interests of, of any parliamentarian to find good ways of scrutinizing those, those decisions that are made across borders. At the moment, we don't have that. I think one of the difficulties is that the way in which those decisions are made is not clear. You know, that the participation in intergovernmental structures isn't clear, isn't effective. And I pick up on the points that, that Deirdre has made about the need for English governments, and that's English governments of whatever political persuasion, to take uh, participating in those intergovernmental structures seriously. Because of course, we as parliamentarians can't scrutinize the governments unless we can see what governments are doing. Uh, and since a lot of the time it's very difficult to see that, I, I'd argue it's probably quite difficult for uh, the devolved governments to see what the UK government is doing some of the time. Um, but it's in, and, it, and the question I think has to go back from what, what, is it in the interests of parliamentarians? Well, is it in the interests of the people we represent is the more important question. Uh, and, you know, we know that um, I'd agree with what Bernard says about you can't have democracy without disagreement because otherwise it's not democracy. But that disagreement has to be open and it has to be clear and we have to understand what we're disagreeing about. Um, but good scrutiny always makes for better government. And what our, the people we represent need is the best possible government at the most appropriate level. 
Um, I just come back to the, the, the point about whether we can do this on the basis of respect and equality. I think we can do that as parliamentarians. I hope that we can. Um, we wouldn't be all taking the time to participate in this discussion. Um, I think the question of how high it gets up on people's agendas as to the things that, that we need to work on is a challenge that others have, have mentioned, but it is a challenge that we need to address. Um, the question about whether we can um, cooperate on, an, on a basis of perhaps I think Deirdre's point about respect rather than equality because you've got different countries of, of different sizes. Um, I don't think we know the answer to that but I, know, I think we do know that it will need a, a, a big shift um, from the Westminster Parliament as well as from the UK government to achieve that. Um, the question for me is, is that achievable with this asymmetrical model of devolution where different things are devolved to different nations in different ways? Uh, I think there is a big question about whether Voice of England is heard in, in all of this. This is a, a personal view, but I think, you know, you know, talking to my English relations there, you are very often confused about when their government is acting as the government of the UK and when it's acting as the government of England. And I think they deserve more clarity in that way. I'm still left wondering whether this can be done when one government, the UK government, effectively has power to attempt to overturn or to get in the way of what the other, other governments want to do. Um, I'd like to be sanguine about that. I, I, you know, I said in my first contribution, I would, I would love to be able to be convinced that this was possible. Um, I am still in the position that this will only be possible when Scotland and Wales are, are independent and when we are able to make our own decisions, albeit in very close cooperation with our nearest neighbours. But in the meantime, we have to have a better way of being able as parliamentarians to scrutinise and we will need those relationships after independence as well. Um, I think it is a challenge for us all to make sure our colleagues are interested in that. It might be a bigger challenge for, for Bernard in the Conservative Party than it is for some of us who live with the uh, realities and conflicts of devolution on a on a day to day basis. Um, but the, well, I'd like to thank the IWA for kicking off this discussion. There'll be more. There'll be more to do. Um, and with that, I'll be able to listen briefly to the next contributor. And then I, I am going to have to leave to do the day job. But it's been a real privilege to take part. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen Mary. Uh, uh, that leads me straight on to, to Mick, because uh, yeah. the same question really is for, for Bernard. How, how are you going to interest a Labour MP who represents a London constituency uh, in this whole agenda? Well, look, the, the, the starting point is, isn't it, that there is enormous common interest and there is within the UK an enormous redistribution of wealth that takes place. Uh, unfortunately, those elements have been breaking down. And I, I think the biggest problem uh, comes back to what is the role of the UK? Uh, and uh, I think that was a problem we struggled with when the Scottish independence uh, referendum took place. We were unable to say what the purpose of the UK was. Now, I think there is actually a very, very clear purpose, but it's the, the basis on which the UK exists. Now, Kilbrandon, Lord Kilbrandon identified this very strongly within the, uh, the report back in 1974 and particularly identified the importance of the English question. Now, he came up with the view of regional parliaments uh, or regional councils within England. And I actually think that is possibly still the way forward or the basis of a model. But what has to happen is there has to be an understanding and a concept of shared sovereignty. We, are, we no longer have a single sovereign UK parliament. We have to actually get an acceptance of the way in which shared sovereignty will work. And unfortunately, the internal market bill, I actually see as very much a centralizing piece of legislation. Now, the, you know, all these issues are fundamentally important, but they are of very little interest to many, many people um, on the street and the people we deal with, but it does affect their lives. So for me, this is actually a duty of all the political party leaders, uh, of uh, government as well as all the governments, 
actually saying how important this is and working to actually achieve change. There is, I think, a relatively straightforward transitional way of dealing with this, and that has got to be reform of the JMC, making it an interim council of ministers with a dispute resolution mechanism. A lot of work has been done, a lot of cross-party support. I think that would take us forward and enable us to actually develop a far broader de uh, debate I think we do need a constitutional convention, something to come up with what should the UK be in the future, but which people would then have to buy in. They choose either to go their own way independently with a different structure, or they buy into a new model. But until we have that thinking across the board, and until we actually have that debate with England, what we have is a rather dysfunctional and fractious uh, deterioration, I think, leading to ultimately a breakup of the United Kingdom. Thanks very much, Mick. Uh, Deirdre. Yeah. Uh, I feel I have to start this um, piece again by saying we are different in Northern Ireland because that's a, invariably what we say at the start of any conversation. And the Conservatives don't really, really stand for election in Northern Ireland, not in any meaningful way. And the Labour Party don't. So I think that does make for a different dynamic in terms of the politics of Northern Ireland. I think it's fair to say though that most people you would ask who are involved in policy development, who are interested in policy, would say that the Celtic devolved regions work well together. So we have very good relationships with Scotland and Wales around our health service, around our issues for education, poverty, inequality. And to be honest, the way that this has developed is England is increasingly becoming the bogeyman. Uh, the person that we don't work well with, the big bad person in the room who's making all our lives in misery. And I really think we need to address that. The difficulty is in terms of trying to promote this agenda is if you move for increased um, interdependence, increased relationships, better relationships, it's viewed by many as a unionist agenda, something that would be good for unionists, but perhaps not good for nationalists. Um, and in the same way, the nationalists will push for a greater north-south agenda and it's viewed by many as a pan-nationalist front. So I think we have to change the parameters of the conversation here to say what we are pushing for is better governance. What we are wishing for are pushing for is to ensure that our voices are heard, that um, for example when we're talking around trade deals that we have ways of articulating how those proposals will impact and affect us. Yes trade is a reserved issue but it doesn't mean that people can be, that you can ride roughshod over the views of people who have maintained businesses here through very dark times. So I think really what we need to uh, look at again is, and it has been mentioned by many of the speakers, is who represents England. And the UK government is in that very unusual position. It's representing England whilst it's still representing the whole of the UK. And that is unsatisfactory on two main counts. Firstly, in terms of size, of course, it's going to be dominant. And it means the concerns from the smaller regions are somehow deemed as secondary. We're demoted to the Vauxhall League and England sit in the premiership. And I think we really need to address that relationship. But also, I think England are denied a unique voice at a time when they really need to articulate their own specific views and voices. It has been commented on many times here that it is ironic that it isn't Irish nationalism and, and the growth of Irish nationalism, the strength of Irish nationalism that is pushing forward the agenda for Irish unity. It is English nationalism. And the belief widespread here amongst many communities that English nationalists really don't care about Northern Ireland, that we are very much the second order. And you have opinion polls coming out and saying, well, Brexit is more important than the union. Uh, Northern Ireland can apparently fall into the sea. And that is very damaging because after the Good Friday Agreement, we had constitutional certainty. The constitutional issue was settled and we have opened up a whole Pandora's box again. And to go back to saying uh, also the Good Friday Agreement has been bandied around ad nauseum in the last six months by anyone who cares to use it to support their own particular agenda, as far as I can see it. And uh, yes, the US have got involved, the EU are involved, the Irish government are involved. But I think the people in the North are beginning to say, well, actually, they would be involved, wouldn't they? Because they have an interest. 
but what what do the English people think? And it, it takes me back to the view that we are really missing the distinct English voice in this debate because it could also challenge some of the preconceptions about English nationalism. It could challenge some of the preconceptions about the fact that the disintegration of the UK doesn't matter. But in the end, whether you're nationalist or unionist in Northern Ireland, I think most people looking at it would agree that work in this area could definitely improve governance, could address the issue of trust. And perhaps at the start of the devolution settlement, much of what happened in this area was based around goodwill the belief that people would work together because it was a good idea, or that personalities involved knew each other, had good relationships, and ergo worked together. I think that's not enough anymore. We need formal uh, mechanisms to ensure that this type of work is undertaken, and a gentleman's agreement simply won't cut the mustard anymore. Thank you, Thank you very much, Deirdre. Now, we have uh, a lot of interesting questions have come in and we're not going to have time to cover them all but I'd like to cover two or three if we can and so please can I ask our colleagues on the panel to uh, try to um, restrict what they say and answer to them. The first question comes from Gethin Rees. Uh, are, are the devolution clauses in the UK Internal Market Bill a result of the kind of misunderstanding and miscommunication to which the panelists refer? Or are they a deliberate attempt to roll back devolution and return to the original Wales model of secondary legislative devolution only? Uh, Mick. Uh, basically, I hope they are a misunderstanding because that means they can be resolved. My fear is that they are deliberate and are causing and going to lead to a constitutional conflict. Pete. I, th I can't see anything other than them being deliberate. What, I think what we're beginning to sort of notice, and it's something that the UK government have been pursuing for the past few years, is what we term as aggressive unionism, which is pretty much trying to undermine the powers of authority of the Scottish uh, Parliament and stifle Scottish democracy. And you can't look at certainly Clause 46 of the um, Internal Markets Bill, which allows for the first time ever the, the right of the UK government to, to legislate and to have funding arrangements in areas that are of clear devolved responsibility, areas even as far up as education, health and culture. And if you look at Clause 46, you, you can't come to any other conclusion that this is just a, a direct assault the responsibility of the Scottish Parliament. Now, the Scotland Act was a, a very, very elegant document, which was designed back in 1998, came at the Constitutional Convention, organised by the Labour Party and the Liberal Party. And what, why it was such a, an interesting and elegant, elegant document is that Schedule 5 listed all the areas that were reserved, and anything that wasn't in Schedule 5 of the Scotland Act was presumed to be devolved. And that has served devolution very well for the past 21 years because there's been a clear understanding about what is reserved, what is devolved. What the Internal Markets Bill does, does for the very first time, and this is why it is such a provocation to us in Scotland, is it blurs that. It, it gets in the way of that very clear, defined set of responsibilities and powers. And I don't think that the UK government would have put that in <laughs> if it wasn't designed to be provocative and it wasn't an attempt to sort of say to the, the Scottish government, we don't like the way you behaved during Brexit. We've got big concerns about you holding legislative consent around huge swathes of Brexit legislation. And this is what we're now going to do to you to try and ensure that you haven't got that same type of authority clout and, um, and, and, and ability to hurt the UK government. And this is why we I can't see any other reason why they would do that. Unless we're not even bothered going into like their, um, their the rest of the things in the internal market bill about the CMA setup, which will effectively be the arbiter of standards across the United Kingdom and our ability then to have, if we wanted to higher standards in Scotland being diminished, I mean, just some of the stuff in this. And this is why for us, it's it's a non-negotiable. I mean, in the internal market, we, we can't go along with it because if we did, we'd be saying to the UK government, yes, we respect your right to undermine our democracy and the powers of our parliament. So this is a huge fight that's coming. We've already said that we, we will not give legislative consent to this. I know the Welsh uh, uh, government have said said that too. Um, will the UK government reconsider this? Absolutely not. I mean, listening to all the language we've seen in the past week or so, particularly around 
Clause 46, and there's things to do with the CMA, they're, they're not on a mind to back down then. They try to tell us it's only additional spending and it's all about assuming the powers of the European Union, as if there's any equivalence between the, the incorporating union, union of the UK and the Union of Partnership from the EU. So none of this works for us, and it's going to be a real, real struggle when it comes to this. And a lot of people have said there's certain things that could break the UK this is most definitely one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Northern Ireland, Deirdre, uh, is it uh, a sectarian divide or its attitude towards the internal market bill there? I think at the start, the focus was almost entirely on the sea border and to an extent this was missed at the outset. It was then highlighted by Sinn Féin and it looked as if it was going to become politicized and sectarianized, but in fact, I don't think it is. I think there's anger across all of the parties that really this is a deliberate assault on the devolved settlement by people who really aren't that committed to devolution and of this huge sway of the powers are going to go back to London and then we might decide if you can get them and you might decide we can't. Again, goes, speaks of this kind of paternalistic, patronistic state that decides what you can and can't have. So one might have guessed that it would be um, much more of a sectarian issue, but I think Unionists are devolved or are committed to devolutionists and always have been and want powers to reside locally. So I don't actually think that this is sectarian. I think there is anger across the piece at what is being attempted here and there will be a, a backlash against it. Bernard, I, I know you don't speak on behalf of the UK government, but uh, uh, last word on this. You're right. Well, I mean, I'd be the first to accept that this has been uh, extremely uh, clumsily handled, like Clause 11 of the EU Withdrawal Act, uh, EU Withdrawal Bill. Um, the, the, the sort of peremptory, peremptory body language and action from a, a white, Whitehall, which has um, been a gift to Pete, people like Pete, who actually, uh, you don't really want all this to work, Pete, do you? If you're really honest, you're delighting in the opportunities that this presents your party. Um, uh, and I don't think that's really the point. I think that's very destructive. Um, in reality, of course, even the architect of the Yes campaign in Scotland, uh, who's unfortunately now died, the a very widely respected Nigel Smith, uh, who was chairman of uh, the Yes campaign in the 1997 Scottish referendum, uh, was very clear that the EU Withdrawal Act was not a power grab because, of course, uh, the powers that the government is retaining at Westminster were powers that were never devolved because they were held by the European Union. And that, that, that fact is sort of tidily ignored. I do recognise that in the Internal Market Bill, um, there is some very, very modest recovery of highly technical stuff. But this is in the interests of the market of the whole of the United Kingdom. It's not in England's interests. It's in order to prevent there being unnecessary barriers between the different parts of the United Kingdom. And these are very, very marginal issues. Um, and I, I would like these issues to be dealt with through proper, properly structured common frameworks rather than by imposition. Um, but I think the sense of grievance that the SNP is demonstrating, for example, it, I mean, they're anxious to amplify this as much as possible for political purposes, which is, a, I think, a shame that we have given them that opportunity. And Northern Ireland is a very much more complicated situation. Um, in my view, the great mistake that Theresa May made was uh, agreeing to the um, agenda, the EU agenda, that there should be no checks on the island of Ireland whatsoever. Now, that flies in the face of what has been happening on the island of Ireland for a very long time. There have always been security checks, there have been VAT checks, uh, there have been SPS checks between North and South, and for that, to insist that there shouldn't even be checks away from the border uh, between North and South really created um, um, an obstacle to a much more sensible arrangement. Uh, uh, between North and South that would, would obviate the need for any idea of tariffs on or, or, or checks on uh, trade across the Irish Sea. Um, and um, I'm very sorry that the British government allowed the European Union uh, to um, exploit that situation. And it's worth pointing out that um, 
the UK government has always been absolutely adamant that there will be no hard border in Northern Ireland. The EU has never given that assurance. So if there's ever to be a hard border in Northern Ireland, don't blame the United Kingdom. I, I'm sure it will never happen. I'm sure it was always a bluff. Um, but the, uh, uh, the Good Friday Agreement was uh, never at risk from anything the UK government was going to do. In fact, the UK government uh, probably regards it more responsibly than those uh, who have been negotiating on part of the European Union. After it was Selmayr who said that, uh, that the uh, Northern Ireland is the price that the United Kingdom must pay for Brexit. And um, uh, that is uh, um, upset one, at least one of the communities in Northern Ireland very, very profoundly. And it is argued that the uh, withdrawal agreement itself is a change in the status of Northern Ireland without the consent of the people of Northern Ireland. There is now a consent mechanism in there, and which in Labour, which is through the Assembly. Um, uh, I hope we can all agree that that will be a way of resolving that. Um, and um, uh, I, but but to I come back to the fundamental point that leaving the European Union actually is resulting in the transfer of substantially uh, substantial new powers uh, to Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. But not all of the powers. Um, and the idea that if the United Kingdom government uh, is responsible for spending money in all parts of the United Kingdom is an affront to the devolution settlement, I think is a very odd notion indeed. Uh, of course, what the SNP do not want is for the United Kingdom government to take a more, um, uh, to, to develop more of a direct relationship between uh, the Whitehall and the uh, citizens of Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland, because that would un undermine the, um, the division. And finally, I would just say that the, the devolution settlement uh, that, that um, is apparently revered by Pete Wishart, that he wants to get rid of through independence, um, uh, wasn't as perfect as well. It was very unnaturally binary. You go to any other decentralized country and you do not get this binary division. It's either rests here or there. Um, and, and in a way, the, um, the arrival of this devolution settlement during our membership of the European Union, uh, it was able to be fudged because so many of the, what are, the, should be the subject of common frameworks in the UK were subject to EU frameworks. Um, and the idea that, that Scotland, for example, has more influence in the European Union than it has with Westminster um, is another um, sort of let's fuel the resentment agenda uh, because uh, I, but I do think that what we need to what the United Kingdom government and parliament need to learn from the European Union is how to inspire much more confidence by institutionalizing the cooperation between the four parts of the United Kingdom uh, rather than uh, just relying on the uh, absence of, of formal frameworks and I think that is the fundamental point and whether Scotland, Wales or Northern Ireland separate from the rest of the United Kingdom, uh, we're going to need those kind of formalised relationships anyway. And I hope by ending on that conciliatory note, I haven't wound everybody up too much. Uh, you certainly haven't, Bernard, and th thank you very much for that. And I, I did say that I hoped that we'd have two or three questions. We only had time for one. Uh, I realise that all our panellists have got busy uh, uh, diaries, and so we're going to have to let them go. But thank you very much, uh, Pete, Mick, Deirdre, uh, uh, Bernard, and in her absence, Helen, for, for being willing to join this event. I uh, think we've heard strong defense of the desirability of greater interparliamentary cooperation and certainly of the two things which I've uh, treasured in my parliamentary life, accountability and transparency. And I think that's, that's what we hope that we will bring through this. And uh, I hope that uh, all, of, all of you who are in positions to influence it will, will hope will uh, add your shoulders to pushing this agenda forward in the future. Such important thank, you. Work. thank you so much. Th thank you very much for joining us and thank, thank you too to the two backroom people, Andy and Laura, who set all this up and uh, are, are responsible for it being as, as successful as it has been. Thank you very much thank and you. thank you very much for all who have listened today. All right. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. We're very grateful to you all for coming. Thank you to Paul for chairing today's conversation so expertly. We'll be picking up on the issues and the questions that have come through the Q&A that we haven't managed to answer and the chat. And we'll be thinking about what happens, what happens next and what we can do at the IWA 
to continue to shine a light on this very important, yes, rather niche, but extremely important issue for the future of the people who live in this country and the people who live across these aisles. Thank you very much, everybody. Good afternoon.